So we're continuing today talking about different testimonies about Jesus. And I, we, we had set this up before that we were going to have this series of these different testimonies from the Bible. But as we've reached these days, when we planned this, we certainly weren't expecting everything that's been going on for the last several weeks. I didn't expect to be doing these uh, to a camera sitting in my office. But here we are. And uh, But I believe God chose this particular uh, theme for this time specifically because it, it, it's incredibly important for us, I believe, to get our eyes in the right place. There's so many things demanding our attention right now that would pull us away, and every one of them would, would make us unsettled in our souls. And I think it's so important right now that we're focused back on the core, back on Jesus. So we talked about, uh, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, John the Baptist's message. And and I want you just for a second here to live in those words again, the reality that Jesus takes away the sins of the world. It's not your good works. It's not your, your effort to try to stop sinning. Jesus takes away the sins of the world. Forgiveness comes. And it is from a standpoint of forgiveness that we then live, that we seek to have that sort of reformation in our lives. And then the reality about who Jesus is, we talked about last Sabbath, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Contained within that confession is the powerful reality that takes us all the way back to the beginning and all the way to the end with our focus on Jesus. And today we want to go again and look at some unlikely testimonies about Jesus. And there's, a, there's a challenge for us in this today. But before we get there, let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open your word and read today about unlikely believers, Lord, help us to be struck by this. Help us to be challenged by this, even rebuked by this if we need to be. Lord, help us to be believers, particularly in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to talk about unlikely testimonies and testimonies that, that raise a troubling question. And this is basically the question. Here it is. Is it possible to have more information but less faith? Sometimes we get caught in this trap. And this trap says, well, if I just knew a little more, if I was just sure of this, and, and, and ever learning but never coming to a knowledge of truth. It's just never quite enough for me to, to fully believe, to put myself into it. And so I ask you the question and, and ask you to consider it. Is information key to faith? Well, I don't think we would want to suggest that information is irrelevant to faith because the whole idea of proclaiming the gospel is to tell good news. But how much good news do I need before I believe? How much detail is required for me to believe. I want to talk about some unlikely testimonies about Jesus. Some unlikely believers. And so we're going to start in a place that we don't usually go this time of year. We're going to start with a story that usually we only touch on it at Christmas. But I don't want to talk about it in a Christmas context here. I want to talk about it in the context of the identity of the ones we're talking about. So, so let's go there right now. We're going to Matthew chapter 2, and, and we find these words. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Who were these guys, these magi from the east, these wise men, as we have called them, and then uh, tended to say there were three of them, although nowhere does that specifically say? Well, I think if we actually were to meet them, we might have been a little more uncomfortable, because in all likelihood, they were to some degree astrologers. And I say that because the thing that got them excited about the notion that a child had been born was they were watching the skies and a strange star appeared. 
They saw something new in the, in the skies. And, and to them, that was an omen. That meant something. So they went to look to try to figure out what this meant. And, and they had different writings. Now, it's, it's not clear from Scripture exactly what they had. But coming from the East, uh, they likely had some uh, Jewish manuscripts of the Jewish Scriptures from other times that they might have looked into, believing that this star was somehow relevant to Israel. It's also possible that they had some writings left over uh, from the days of Balaam the prophet. You remember Balaam who came down to Balak and he was supposed to curse Israel? Well, there's something very interesting that Balaam says in the midst of his attempting to curse Israel. And it's found in Numbers chapter 24. And I want to read it to you. And I want to ask you, would this be enough for you? It goes like this. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab and the skulls of all the people of Sheth. Edom will be conquered. Seir, his enemy, will be conquered. But Israel will grow strong. A ruler will come out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the city. Now, you read that, and, and maybe what sticks out to you there is the, the violence of this description, and it's kind of hard to associate that with Jesus. But let's put ourselves in the context of these magi. They're reflecting. They see a star. Someone remembers this passage. They go back. They read it. It says, a star will appear. A ruler will come. Would that be enough for you to gather up expensive gifts and to travel across the desert a long ways? Well, apparently it was enough for them. We go on with the story. Verse 9 in Matthew 2, after they had heard the king, they went to King Herod to try to find out because they thought, well, if we know about this, surely everyone in Israel knows about it. But of course, nobody did. After, they'd met, after they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So many should have known what was going on in Bethlehem, but they didn't. Yet here are these magi, these astrologers, these whatever exactly they were, from a completely different place, who because they saw something different in the heavens, traveled the whole way, and when they encountered Jesus, believed and worshipped. It's amazing to me, I, I think one of the most amazing parts of this story, is how God used these these guys who shouldn't have even known what was going on. Yet because they were paying attention, he used them to bring the gifts that likely provided for the needs of baby Jesus in the time when his family, just after this, had to flee to Egypt and live there. Isn't it interesting? Sustained by the Magi from the East and protected in Egypt, the land of slavery. Do we always understand how God is working? When we look at these magi, they acted on faith and conviction. But they weren't acting on a million pages of information. It would have been very easy for them to take the attitude, well, yeah, that's kind of wild skepticism. I mean, kind of wild, a wild theory you've got there. I'm skeptical about that. I, I don't know if I'm going to do that. But they went. They acted. They believed. How much information do you need in order to believe? I want to go to another story. This is later in Jesus' life. And this is the story of someone who amazed 
Jesus. Now, just that concept alone is interesting to think about because when you think about Jesus and what it was like for him interacting, sometimes it seemed like he knew everything and and nothing surprised him. Other times there were things that happened that did surprise him. And this is an example of a time that that happened. And this story is found in Matthew chapter 8. So we go there, Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion, so this is a Roman soldier, came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Now, Jesus' response is very uh, very much in line with how things have gone. You remember the, the head of the synagogue, his daughter was sick and ultimately she would die. But he comes and says, please come to my house and help me. And it was standard for Jesus to go to where the healing needed to take place. So he's saying to the centurion, do you want me to come there and help you? But look what happens. The centurion replied, Lord... I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. That one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. This is an amazing moment. Jesus is amazed by this centurion's faith and by the way he understands the authority that Jesus has. Who taught him this? How did he know this? He said, no, I get it. I understand authority. You have authority over disease. I don't need you to come here. Just say the word. And then Jesus is amazed. And and he says, I tell you, I have not found anyone. Now, who would anyone include? Well, that would include the disciples, wouldn't it? Isn't that an interesting reality? Certainly, the centurion was not ready to be a disciple of Jesus. He, He lacked so much of the context and the background. Yet in this moment, his faith exceeds that of Jesus' followers. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. So in the context of this, it becomes clear to Jesus that there are many out there who have not had the privilege of the information, yet their faith is strong. And he says, you know what? God will honor that faith. And in the kingdom of heaven, many will come from the east and from the west and sit down at the table, even though they didn't have all the information. The Magi came from the east. The centurion came from the west, yet they believed in Jesus. And all the while, so many who had so much information had so little faith. So here's the point. If you're willing, you can believe. But if you're not willing... Nothing is going to convince you. If you're willing, just the smallest interaction with Jesus is going to bring a conviction to your heart. If you're unwilling, you can memorize the scriptures and still not believe. Convicting power can fall at any time. And this is clear in the next two testimonies about Jesus I want to share. Because convicting power falls... But it falls at a point where Jesus isn't even in control of things. Maybe we could say in this case, Jesus is is in the midst of his ministry. He's doing healings. It kind of looks like he's winning. But these next two examples, they don't fit that at all. I want to tell you about another centurion. 
Only this time, this is a centurion who very likely just a few minutes before, within the last few hours, had been recently mocking Jesus and possibly even participated in beating him. This is one who was watching Jesus in the moments of his agony as he was on the cross and as he went through the various different things he said at the very end of his life and then finally the very last things he said. And we're going to the book of Mark this time. Mark 15 verse 39. It says, And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. How much information did he have? The only information he had was he watched how Jesus suffered and died. And after seeing that, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. How could he know that? Many will come from the east and the west, Jesus said. I want to give you one more. One more example, one more unlikely example. But before I do, I want to ask this question again. Is it possible to have less information but more faith? Lastly, I asked that question at the beginning, but I ask it to you again. Is it possible to have less information but even more faith? Let's go on. This time, Luke, chapter 23, verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. So Jesus is, is now being taken to be crucified. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified Jesus there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. It could be the centurion is participating in this, the one that's going to testify in just a minute. The people, now watch what the people with lots of information did. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Now, now look at this scenario. The people who are supposed to know are mocking him and sneering at him. The soldiers seemingly have complete control over him. And even the criminal who's up there with him says, Look, you're no better than us. You're in the exact same state we're in. Is Jesus in control right now? Does he look like he's winning? Yet. Watch what happens. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing deserving. This man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Where does that come from? What kingdom? Jesus is dying on the cross. What kingdom? Yet somehow, somehow, this criminal sees in Jesus a king. It's not like everybody saw that. Because where are Jesus' disciples now? They've all gone away because he's not winning. They've fled. There's a few women left. John is there. Yet somehow, this criminal 
And in a few minutes, a centurion will see something more in Jesus. In this moment, here's Jesus' reply. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's a bold statement, isn't it? Here's the thing. The eyes of faith will see past the distractions of the current moment and the ugliness of the current conditions and will be able to see through that all the way to the day when Jesus reigns on the earth. This is what the criminal did. He knew he was dying for something he did. He knew Jesus was not. And he could look past where they were and what was going on to the day of the kingdom of God. So my question to you, do your eyes see that far? If the day we're living in is anything like the days of the past, then we can likely expect that there will be information-rich so-called believers who will crumble under pressure while seemingly ignorant in comparison in the ways of God, others will find strength in Jesus. It's very possible in this day that many who have made a practice of church and have been there routinely and, and made a practice of of even reading the Bible, but have not made it their purpose to have strong faith in Jesus. When they're confronted with this reality that does not align with their expectations, their, their whole foundation will crumble because it's not built on Jesus itself. It's built on information. It's built on stuff. It's built on doctrine. And when life doesn't turn out right, even though they're living right, the whole thing begins to crumble. Yet all around on the edges are these people that we would have otherwise thought, yeah, they're, they're not good believers at all, who are because of faith finding strength and courage in Jesus in an hour of need. Is it possible to have more information but less faith? Well, these stories suggest that that's true. And in fact, these stories suggest another question. Is it possible to have less information but more faith? Well, in fact, these stories would suggest that is absolutely true. But I want to suggest that neither one of these is best. This is what I want to suggest, and this is what I hope is your reality. It is possible to have more information and more faith. Be a believer. If you are willing, you can believe. The world is full of people who are trying to use this notion of a lack of information as an excuse to not believe. But I think we can see from these stories that the volume of information is not the key. The key is the willingness of your heart to be open to the Holy Spirit. So here's the confession I want us all to make today. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is what we put our faith in. Even when the times are tough. These are the words of a man dying. He would die that day. But he said, Jesus, there's going to be a better day. There's going to be a day when your kingdom gets established. On that day, remember me. Did he have a right to ask? No, he was a criminal. But you see, the grace of Jesus, this is the reason he came and died, was to save sinners who believe. So I want you to say this with me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Let's say this together right now. Are you ready? Now, and I want you to say it with faith in your heart. I want you to mean this. 
Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Does that give you a little hope? That gives me a little hope in my heart. Because I'm not confident in the kingdoms of the world right now. But Jesus is going to remember me. He doesn't forget. He has the grace to forgive. He has the power to heal. So be a believer. And when Jesus comes into his kingdom, he will remember you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, look upon us. None of us are worthy. But we say to you, remember us when you come into your kingdom. Whatever we face in the days ahead, whatever trials we will go through, whether this be short or protracted, whether it be just a bump in the road or a, a hugely impactful, life-changing reality for all of us, put all that aside. Jesus, remember us when you come into your kingdom. That's our prayer. May our faith be strong. In Jesus' name, amen.